Hello, we are the doctors Bjorkman and we have just detailed kind of all the medical evidence going through IVF and this week we want to just sit down and share what it was like to be people, people. and medical people going mm -hmm. through IVF. Yeah, so this week we're kind of just now that we're through it kind of looking back on our experiences some of the complications we had that were unexpected um, and pro tips for some of you if you are going through it. If this is your first time meeting us, I'm Sarah. I'm a board certified OBGYN and ironically also a fertility doctor. And I'm Kurt. I'm a board certified pediatrician and expert support person. Yes. <laughs> Maybe not so expert. And, and we, we are, are the, the Doctors, Doctors Bjorkman. Bjorkman. Welcome back. As we mentioned, this week's episode is just us awesome vlogging our experience with IVF. Definitely not something we ever anticipated needing in the first place, especially after having a baby naturally the first time. Yeah. Um, and there was an uh, unexpected complication along the way as well that definitely wasn't expected. Which we can talk about yeah. that too. But hopefully in us sharing our experience, it can be helpful to you. Yeah. So, IVF, the whole shebang was quite, it's a lot. It's just a lot. So we knew though that we wanted to have our kids closer together. We sat down and kind of done the research on how long, you know, is ideal to wait between kids from mm -hmm. a, you know, safety, health and pregnancy safety kind of standpoint and did a whole video on that evidence that you can check it out. But kind of around that six month mark, we said, hey, let's try, let's start trying. I was having regular cycles. We said cool let's give it a shot and did all the things tracked ovulation with ovulation mm -hmm. predictor kits and i got a mira after the first couple months because i was like let's let's Just have, let's hormones, have more data life, yeah. you know because that also shows kind of how your estrogen rises and um was ovulating doing all the right things and month after month we were getting negatives so at the six month mark i said you know what I'm just gonna get some of my labs checked. Maybe my prolactin's elevated because I was still breastfeeding a little bit. Or, you know, maybe my thyroid is off. Or maybe, you know, as you, you may have, some of you have noticed my little thyroid nodule that I sometimes have. It's benign, thank you for um, checking on me. But I was like, something's gotta be going on. We should be pregnant right now. Studies have shown that 75% of couples um, are pregnant in the first six months. And so while the kind of recommendation to go get a workup started is after 12 months of unprotected intercourse, if you're having regular cycles or you know six months if you're over 35, your fertility doctor or your OBGYN is certainly happy to see you sooner if mm -hmm. you want to make sure you're not missing anything or kind of find out what's going on. Um, and so, kind of got those that initial workup on me all of it was normal and so we said let's see what's going on with you babe yeah which i think is something interesting so often when you think about infertility you think about it as a female issue but like one in three to even one in two cases of infertility have some degree of male factor infertility yeah um and we both had had covid in the midst of trying and mm -hmm. knew that there was some effect of covid on sperm motility count yeah sperm count things, okay yeah. yeah so um with that went and got a semen analysis um and found that he did. Um, that was the experience. boys needed some help yeah yeah, he was so, guys are so weird about their sperm. Like, I remember when, <laughs> when Kurt was like doing this, he was A, very bashful, and B... It's not a romantic experience. It's like a cold, I guess every room may be different, but this was like a cold, sterile room. They don't provide any help, like... <laughs> Please. Um, <laughs> but... I mean, just all sorts of things like, well, maybe I missed the cup a little bit or just all these different excuses for like why maybe this semen analysis wasn't perfect and I just rolled my eyes. Um, but the semen analysis wasn't perfect. Not and perfect. so we kind of said, eh, there's this little mild male factor here. What do we want to do? We tried a little bit of ovulation induction and I just 
wasn't excited. You know, there's like a, when you do ovulation induction with Clomid or Letrozole, there's about a 10% chance of having multiples. So more than one, mm -hmm. which bless all you mamas and dads and caregivers that do multiples, but whew, one at a time is, was always my goal and Cease is a two person job. So I don't know how we're ever going to have that second baby here, but, um, we, we kind of said, hey, we probably want more than one more kid, and I don't want to have two. So we said, let's move to IVF. Yep. And we also like had this thought that we're not sure how many kiddos we want to have, and thinking that depending on what life throws at us, having some extra embryos, if we're going to have recurrent issues getting pregnant, right. might be helpful for us and an and opportunity for us to use Right. And our struggles at this time to like help us if in we ex future. want to expand our family even further. Right, especially because if you have extra embryos, then they're on ice and you can kind of use them even after the age of natural fertility. You know, if you wanted to do an embryo transfer at 44 or 45, that isn't, you know, they're in the freezer. Yeah, so we're working on building a football team. So, <laughs> so it was really to be on the other side. Um, as someone who has taken care of couples with infertility for a long time to then be like, oh, this is us now. Um, I need, you know, I'm going to be taking the shots. I've got to do the ultrasounds. I have to do all these things. And your doctors are just people too mm -hmm. with the same neuroses and fears and <laughs> man you should have seen me in my appointment with our pharmacist when we were going over meds I mean I took two pages of notes and there's a, so many moving pieces with IVF you're doing ultrasounds kind of every other day it's the only one of the only medical procedures out there where you have this question mark of when the procedure is going to be. It's so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. You don't know exactly mm -hmm. how your body's going to respond. And this is all on the heels of like, you really have wanted a baby for a really long time. And for whatever reason, you haven't gotten it. And then they give you a bunch of hormones. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot. You were a delight with the hormones. <laughs> the right always a delight. um so the shots were not as bad so the injectable like gonadotropins for the stem meds were not as bad as i expected yeah. like i was like oh this isn't that bad I, this was yeah and we bad. documented all of that too yeah. yeah and so i think i was surprised by that the progesterone and oil sucked tremendously when did you that was that the, you started on we started on the night retrieval night for the five days before transfer and then through through the eighth week of pregnancy okay. for many it's 10 or 12 weeks um and man your buns just really and you have to it's like you have to do these shots every day no matter where you mm -hmm. are like I was out to dinner some, like for some work thing and at eight o'clock it was time to take my meds and so I had to like jump up from the, the table and take my little green you know pack of meds and inject some folistim while I was out to eat and so it's just like this constant thing that you always have to do thankfully it's a it's the stim is a condensed time frame. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, like 10 to 12 days of those injectable meds, but there's you a lot a of- a little bit more things. leeway with the progesterone and oil shot too. Yep, yeah. yep. Okay. So then retrieval. Yeah, retrieval, which was the procedure day. I think, would you say of like the whole process, that's the biggest procedure, right? Right, yes. Yeah. Like you are going, it's a procedure. Many clinics you are going to kind of be put to sleep while you're breathing on your own, but you, there's anesthesia so you don't feel or remember anything. Um, and so it's, you know, they say, hey, don't eat or drink after midnight. This is the day where we're gonna go and retrieve those eggs. It's everything you've been working for right there. One of the kind of traditions in infertility and in IVF is like creative, cute, like shirts, socks, etc. Like socks that say, I've got this, IVF got this. Or I've seen some doc, some being on the other end, like when I'm doing embryo transfers, that say like, knock me up, doc. Um, and, and different things like that. Tons of like cute, creative, things. The socks I chose 
<clears throat> for, for retrieval day were these. And they, they say, the universe is kind of a dick. <laughs> and it's, I, you know, I just felt like it was appropriate for the moment. And just a shot back to say, yeah. Why do we have to do Why this? Why am I doing this? But anyway, ironically, then I ended up having this major complication after my retrieval. I uh, started feeling really unwell the night of um, the retrieval. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you were like, couldn't sit up, severe, severe pain. Yeah. The, the, my, the, fi like I, my finest moment was I could not, I could not move. I was in so much pain. I couldn't take a deep breath. I just had radiating pain through my shoulders and my back. I was just like this awful pain cycle. Which and are all reasons to call your IVF doctor. Call your doctor, go yeah. to the hospital. Um, I, I just couldn't move and Kurt literally brought me a cake pan from the kitchen to put under me so I could pee. Cause I like, I couldn't get out of bed to yeah. go to the bathroom. I was in so much pain. Um, Again, alarm signs that we should have probably went in. Right. <clears throat> I had a really super rare complication. This is like less than 1% of the time. I kind of bled into my ovary and ended up bleeding like a liter and a half um, into my abdomen and my ovary. And so that pain was caused by that free fluid and some blood mm -hmm. irritating my peritoneum. And so I rationally knew what was happening. I was like, there's fluid in my abdomen. There's probably some blood in here. This is referred pain. This is what I'm feeling. I'm okay. I'm hemodynamically stable, meaning like my heart rate's fine. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not, I'm fine. Um, because like just fluid in the abdomen can be a complication too. Yeah. And like trying to balance like, was this normal or was right. this like? I knew it wasn't I, I knew it wasn't ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is the other kind of complication we worry about um, is when your ovaries kind of go into overdrive and pull a bunch of fluid into your abdomen and you can get fluid around your lungs and it thins your blood so you're at an increased risk for blood clots. And I knew it wasn't that. <laughs> However, it was something else all its own special. Mm -hmm. um, so I did, Kurt texted my doctor th at 5.30 the next morning and was like, She's not looking great. She's We're gonna, great. she's napping. She doesn't look better in two hours. I'm bringing her in for an ultrasound and some blood work. Yeah, so in we went to the clinic where I work and shortly, I mean like, I, Kurt wheeled me in in a wheelchair I got upstairs, our clinic's on the second floor, and proceeded to Vomit puke everywhere. all over. Fine, our the dear, thing you always want to do at the place you work. Is I to literally show them like you our them. dear sweet receptionist was like, like wiping off my sh vomit off my shoe. Bless her heart. Um, and so anyway, went and did an ultrasound. Sure enough, ovary was huge. Some fluid in my pelvis. My hematocrit had dropped. Your blood count. Uh, my blood yeah. count had went way down just saying, hey, I bled. But again, I was fine. Like it's one of those things that the body resolves on its own. And my doc gave me some more pain meds and some Zofran and I kind of just went home to rest for the next couple days and then was fine. But that was a hiccup. That and fortunately, we, you were well enough to be able to do fresh transfer yes. the next week. But back to this. The universe is kind of a dick. Um, but yeah, my thing was I really just wanted to be well enough to be able to do a fresh transfer. And sometimes mm -hmm. if you develop OHSS or you're really just not well, we say, hey, let's pump the brakes on the transfer. Let's not get you pregnant right mm -hmm. now. Let's get you recovered and then... Um, do your transfer but I really really like all of you just wanted to do that transfer and so was like I need to be fine yeah. and thankfully I was by embryo transfer day as you saw like we were feeling great it was a wonderful day and got our french fries and did the whole thing yeah I, I would say like the process was inter like I ended up being needed to be a much more active support person than I ever imagined like it's so you know I thought it was interesting being the the male in this trio, like, trio, there's just two of us. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> 
too. <laughs> Sorry. In this group, like, I don't know, it, like, it definitely is, like, less connected. Like, my part, like, I did solo in a room that, like, because we were doing a fresh transfer was on the day of, and so she was getting wheeled back by anesthesia. I went um, and did my part that then they were able to combine the, the yeah, eggs and the sperm mm -hmm. and make embryos, and which is just this wonderful, beautiful thing. That, like, I don't know, it felt a little bit emotionally different or more totally. distant than usual. Like, it's definitely a yeah. medicalized way to have yeah. a baby. It is not the old fashioned way. Yeah. It's a lot less fun. But which is why it was so nice that at least like on transfer day, like I was there holding your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's kind of a magic moment at the end of a long journey. And mm -hmm. um, as you saw last week, we were very lucky. Our first transfer worked. Um, that is not always true. Um, depending on your age, it's kind of a coin toss if that person's going to work. Um, and it, you saw the roller coaster of the mm -hmm. testing and, um, it, it was kind of surreal when, Hey, now we're pregnant. And like I tell all my patients, well, you did get not get pregnant the old fashioned way. Now you're just pregnant. Yeah. Um, and so the progesterone and oil shots continued and it's just circling back to those suck. Um, and again, it's this thing you have to do every single day. If you go anywhere, you have to take it. Sometimes maybe you're not with your person who gives yeah. you shots. So like my mom gave me a shot. My sister gave me a shot. Two, two or three of my friends gave me shots. Um, and <laughs> you're just like, oh, here's, you know, my little butt cheek. Can you please just stab, stab this injection right there for me? Um, and it become, it certainly becomes you feel better about doing it when you do have that positive pregnancy test because you're like, I'm doing this for a reason. Um, Probably never fun though. Never fun. Never fun. Never fun. The sock we did like, a, we, a, like I made a sock full of rice, rice and I was able to microwave and that was a great little heating pack yep. that helped. It did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would put hold that on afterwards. I'd have Kurt would like massage it really well and then I'd put a heating pad on afterwards and that helped. Sometimes they usually say kind of alternate sides when you inject it. And sometimes one side will get more sore than the other. So you can, you know, if you want to do one side twice in a row or three times because one side's really sore, that's totally okay. Um, but it's just all that there's lots of tricks out there. You can ice beforehand having a nice massage from your partner. The big thing after you do it is to keep moving just to get that muscle moving because you're injecting into a muscle and it's sore. Um, yeah. PIO. PIO. Progesterone and oil. Oh, okay. Two thumbs down, yeah. but needed for supporting an early developing pregnancy. Progesterone, progestation, need it, gotta do it. There's different regimens out there as well. Um, if you can't do that injection every day where you do the injection kind of every third day, so there are different protocols where you can get around the everyday injection. Totally depends on your clinic. Yeah. And I would say like if we, like, I don't know, I'm trying to think like big take homes that like we learned. Yeah. I think the one thing going through the process, you can let me know if it's, and you don't agree with this, but like the importance of having a team that listens. Like it was so nice. Like we have a relationship with, with your fertility doctor just right. because we do, but just the ability to say, hey, something's different here. Um, picking up the phone, calling the clinic, and being heard, and right. having a team that responded to that. Totally. It makes such a difference. Yeah, and I think, so if you find yourself not getting pregnant and facing infertility, your OBGYN can certainly start that workup in doing some of the basic lab tests. Um, and when it is time to find that REI, Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Specialist, um, take some times, you know, I've, we talked about it in the, like finding your OB, your OB provider for when you're pregnant. It's very, a similar thing for when you're doing IVF, you want to find a doctor that you trust, mm -hmm. that you feel like listens to you. Um, and it's worth finding a good fit in terms of how to do that. There are one of the big websites is sart.org, S-A-R-T dot org. Um, and that can help you, you can, it has a find a clinic feature. And 
it will help you, you can type in a location and it helps you find IVF clinics in that area. You can also click on um, the success rates for each clinic so you can see what kind of outcomes they have based on age. So it also has a calculator um, in terms of predicting IVF success that you can put your information in your age, some different variables about you. That is a pretty good predictor tool of what are my chances if I do IVF? Because, you know, IVF is a huge investment in time money, mm -hmm. uh, emotion. It's, it's just, you know, it's not something in, that's without risk either. Um, and so obviously there is a potential for great reward, but there is also a potential for complications, heartache, many things that not being successful. And so while we are so thankful that our transfer worked, you know, I see patients every day to talk about their IVF and why it didn't work. And it is really important um, in those moments that you are trusting your doctor mm -hmm. and feel like you can ask questions and get answers. And I, I, I have patients apologize every day and say, oh, I was Googling, I know I shouldn't be. And I just always say, no, it is fine. You can mm -hmm. look this up, ask me about it. We can talk about yeah. it. Knowledge is power. Yeah. You Absolutely. deserve to have that information. And if you have a question about something that's out there, let's talk about it together. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, truly find a team you trust, especially in the age of telehealth. Um, you, you know, even if it isn't like immediately local for you, if there's someone in your sort of geographic area, often um, the clinics are used to making that kind of thing work. It's really worth it to find a team that you trust. So that's kind of the wrap on IVF. We're pregnant. Yeah. It worked. It's very weird. Just like we're going to do a kind of a first trimester vlog because it's been very different. Very different. Some of it I think is baby number two. Some of it is baby number two. Some of it I think is IVF. Some of it was like the season of life we were in, you know, as we were doing it all, but it's just kind of surreal. Yeah. Um, and we're also chasing a very active toddler. Right? Yeah. It's just like the brain yeah. is gone because it's just dedicated to chasing a toddler. Right. But anyway, a fun problem to have. Um, yes. Yeah. Make sure you're subscribed to follow us through yeah. pregnancy number two. Number two. Um, and if you have any questions, please leave them below. We try to get to those when we can. We also have a Sunday Q&A um, where we an answer a couple of your questions every week. So please check those out. We so appreciate you all being here with us and have appreciated your support and well wishes as we have gone through this. It means the world. Um, so thanks for being here. Yeah. Bye, guys. We're doctors. But not your doctors. Anything we've said in this video is for education or entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice. Any specific medical questions you have should be directed to your provider.